Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Options Animal Weekly. This is Greg. Glad to be here today. Uh, I'm joined by two of my favorite people on the planet. Aww. Eric, Eric Hale, glad to have oh. you here. Oh, Karen. I thought you met your wife and. Oh, son. well, I am actually I am actually at home today, but I'm just sitting in my home office. So, but no, I'm talking about you two. I'm talking about you two. Ah, uh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, my 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 hope is for you guys is that you were long this week, because <laughs> good grief, can we go any higher? I, before I guess before we get into talking too much about what's gone on in the market, I need to remind everyone that the information in the broadcast today is for educational and illustrative purposes only. No way a recommendation to buy or sell any security, nor should it be considered any type of investment advice. Remember that the stock and options market do involve risk and you should have a firm understanding of the rights, the risks, the obligations associated with all your trading instruments before considering placing any type of trade. And make sure and have those primary and secondary exit points planned because you never know when the market's gonna get, just get too bullish, which has been the case, right? I mean, up, up and away. Uh, the, the stat I read today is that 18 days into the trading year now, we have now surpassed almost 70% of the analysts' end of year target on the S&P already uh, with the finish <laughs> at 28.72. Only, only five out of 10 analysts or five out of 15 analysts had, had uh, end of year targets higher than where we're at just, you know, to to uh, or not even three three full weeks into the year and you know to be honest it's a starting to get a little bit unnerving how bullish this is going you know especially the last couple of days because we've we ha I thought we you know we had a little bit of profit taking this week especially in the tech sector I'm like okay good here it comes we're going to get a little bit of pullback um, on Tuesday uh, I think was the day we got a little bit of a pullback and yet. Even though we did have some sell-off and some big names like Apple had a little bit of a sell-off this week. And, you know, you had companies like Facebook take a little bit of a breather, at least for the first part of the week. Then by the end of the week, it didn't. Um, you know, Microsoft, Google, some of the big, big tech names took a little bit of a breather. You had other names just absolutely just barreling to the upside all week long from, you know, Amazon to Netflix to... Uh, Boeing, I mean, you can go down a list of stocks and just, we're starting to get parabolic right now. I didn't, I wasn't expecting this bullish of a move, but this move in January is getting really kind of stupid. I'll be honest, <laughs> I, can't, I can't think of a better word. I, I'm, I'm bullish, but it's stupid bullish right now. I mean, it's crazy. Look at the RSI on the, on the SPX right now. We are at 80 seven on the RSI almost that is just unreal Eric are you bullish right now uh, hey I'm trading what I got it's, it, 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 you, I agree with you 100 percent I don't think anybody's um, anybody's surprised it's a really good week too I, lots of good stuff going on and listening to people talking Davos and you know I, I don't have access to these numbers but I do hear there is still a ton of cash sitting on the sidelines and I was talking to an investor Fester early part of this week who said, you know, I've, I'm basically been I, for the past three years, I haven't really been in the market. And there are a ton of people on the sidelines watching this go. And, you know, when you say parabolic, that is that is the word. I mean, there's no doubt if you look at this trend that we've had going up until December is being very bullish. I mean, just look at January. It is just insane you know just i mean like i was i was gonna say you know we he said we're almost we're higher than like 70 percent of the forecast for the year can we just like put the market on pause and just you know for the next 11 months just just stay here <laughs> <laughs> what about you karen what do you think yeah you know today was the day that surprised me because the other days this week we were kind of starting to hesitate and i thought oh well we know that overbought conditions can be worked off one of two ways either with a pullback like you mentioned greg or with time with consolidation and so i thought okay this is going to be that sort of consolidation phase and then of course today came and in particular if you break down today's price action most of well i shouldn't say most of but there was certainly a a push maybe uh option x 
Inspiration Friday sort of event that happened in the last 30 minutes that really uh, catapulted things. In terms of that overbought condition, if you happen to take a look at a weekly chart, so a one-year weekly candle chart on, on the S&P, we are actually above 90 on the RSI on that particular chart. And Greg, I was actually going to ask you because you, I've been involved now uh, with Options Animal and, and you know very active in the markets since 2008, 2009. I don't think I can remember a time so far in this bull that we were that overbought, technically speaking, on the RSI. Even in 2013, when we started the year very bullish, if you recall, that was a you know quite a, a big year for the S&P. I don't remember going to, to these extremes. And so I, I tend to agree with you gentlemen that you have to trade the bull bullishly. Long calls on the SPY have worked really well uh, here recently, but at the same time, uh, you know, common sense just says, hmm, how long can this go? And And in particular, is this sort of that quote unquote blow off top that often accompanies some sort of volatile, bearish volatility, dare I you know, say that out loud, uh, that can come to the marketplace. So Greg, do you remember being that overbought in this bull? I don't, maybe we have not, been and I just don't recommend. Not this bull. The last time okay. I remember being, the last time I remember this type of euphoria was 1999. Um, and it wasn't across the market like this one is. 1999, although the whole market was relatively bullish, it was really just a handful of tech stocks, you know, the internet-based type of companies that were this bullish. And in fact, you were seeing a lot of selling pressure in some of the other names of people like, yeah, I don't want to own Walmart or Home Depot or Boeing or you know, any of the airlines right now because I want everything in Silicon Valley. And so there was a huge rush to everything.com. And some of you may remember that, some of you may not. This one is across the board. It is really hard to find a sector that is not participating in this rally right now. Uh, and part of that I think does come back to what we've been saying for several years now that has been driving this market and that is Tina, that there is no other alternative, except for there always was one other alternative that we just didn't talk a lot about because we don't trade it a lot, but that was the bullish bond market that was going on right alongside the S&P uh, for the last five years. Well, that may be where a lot of this cash is coming from because the bond market is starting to show signs of weakness. We are starting to see some selling going on. I think there's a lot of people who have been, you know, in bonds for the last five to 10 to arguably 15 years that now that there are several signs on the horizon that the bond rally may be over, whether it's, you know, comments from, you know, China from a few weeks ago that said, we're no longer gonna be buying US bonds. Uh, whether you believe it or not is one question. I know President Trump came out and said that was fake news. Um, but, you know, China said they're not going to be buying bonds anymore. Report, report I believe, from Bloomberg. Um, the one report that I think is very clear and it is going on is the selling pressure in the bond market that's coming from the Federal Reserve. We know they're selling. They, we know they're decreasing their balance sheet. They started in October. You know, we, we know we've got about four and a half trillion dollars of debt that's going to get sold back into the market uh, from that standpoint. And so rather than getting defensive and moving to cash right now with it, I think what's happening is you're seeing a huge influx into the S&P 500 and other dollar denominated assets. Now, a lot I think of the, a lot of this move, you could arguably say, has been at least this week has been fueled by Davos. I know, Eric, you mentioned it. Uh, you know, the interesting move earlier in the commentary early in the week was from Secretary, you know, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, who said a weak dollar is good for the United States and good for our trade policy. Uh, and so you saw everything dollar denominated, whether it's the S&P, whether it's things like gold, whether it's things like, uh, well, other than maybe Bitcoin didn't. But, you know, the dollar decline um, has had, I believe, some positive pressure. Uh, on the S and P, so Eric, you know, you, you hinted at Davos. You know, what are some of the other things that maybe you saw this week that helped push this bullish market, or or maybe just kept the the uh, kept the pedal to the metal, so to speak? 
So, I mean, everybody from Larry Fink and Blank Fine and Dalio and, well, I don't know if you saw it. Did you see Trump's speech today? I, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. It, it was a darn good speech. It was, I mean, I, I don't know. Somebody must have made him practice because you can always tell when he's going off script, but it, it was a very well-written speech. I thought it was excellent. Uh, made a lot of sense. And I mean, it was, it was pretty good. Uh, we don't see U.S. presidents going there a lot and, and talking. Uh, but one of the things that came out, and you you mentioned this on the U.S. dollar, and this this is something that that does have impact on the market. And it's it's I remember a time not too long ago, and I mean like four or five years ago, maybe longer, uh, where it was only the U.S. dollar that seemed to matter. It was the strength of the dollar, and the weaker the dollar got, the higher the market went. And I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. There's a point where a weak dollar is not good. And it's funny that you commented on that because you know Mnuchin said this week that you know that hey, a weak dollar is good for the economy, and and, and generally it is. And no president ever says he has a weak dollar policy because uh, I think some people it's it's too much to explain to too many people. You know, they think like it's like saying you know I'm going to burn the flag or something like that they equate the US dollar with um, you know some some sort of symbolism and but a you uh, what what a weak dollar does is it makes our products more attractive uh, I think what we're seeing is is definitely this this blue line is the weakening and this is something from um, Dave Wilson from Bloomberg News he sends out a, a chart of the day and this is the chart of the day and this is something that came from Jim Paulson from Lutal group um, that was saying hey hold on here a moment because a weak dollar is okay it does but considering everything else considering the situation with the 10-year treasuries this could actually be a bad thing so and that's true I mean the, when the dollar gets too weak it, it's a bad thing so having the US dollar uh, lower does um, does make our products uh, more attractive. It makes it harder for us to buy things outside of the United States, but it certainly helps our products and people who are exporting things. And, um, and, and, and generally what happens is we'll see a rally in commodities and we'll also see uh, the market tends to go up with a weaker dollar as well. So it, it, Karen, did you have any thoughts on the US dollar, any of this commentary? What did you, what did you think about this week? With regards to it definitely that. provided yeah it, it provided some intraday volatility obviously on Wednesday that was that day where we had the there for a while we were getting into a pattern it, it looks like the buy programs trigger in the mornings and we head up and then we kind of top out a little bit and then on Wednesday in particular when all of that vernacular was coming out that's when we saw that quite volatile day big swing uh, on the Dow in particular uh, I think it all comes back to the context as well of the Fed. And uh, if, in fact, this lower dollar does start to lead to stronger and stronger inflation, uh, when does the Fed start to become uh, a nuisance, maybe, if you will, to these markets? Uh, we're going to have a new Fed chair. It, it's going to be a really interesting year, obviously, uh, as we move forward. So not a lot of talk about that at this moment in time. And, of course, I don't want to jump too far forward into the, the data of the week and that sort of thing. But uh, in that context, I think it's, it's, it could be really intriguing as we head forward. Will they continue to be as friendly and benign to the markets in light of the fact uh, that we have these forces that obviously could start to, quote unquote, overheat for maybe for the first time uh, in this entire bull run? So that's something to kind of keep in the on the back burner. But at least at this moment in time, markets aren't don't care, don't seem to care about that sort of thing at present. So what do you think, think Greg, in terms of the no, Fed? I, yeah. I think you're absolutely right there, Karen. I think, you know, if you take a step back and look at the big picture economy, you know, you all, you, if you go back to level one, if you think what, what we always talk about, what drives the economy, well, it's a good labor market. Well, we've had a, we've had a good labor market here domestically for several years now. Now, we're operating, I would say, at full employment, yet – really through most of 2014 and 2015, even through most of 2016, the market didn't really rally like you thought it may have based on full employment, it, based on good S&P earnings. Yeah, it was bullish, but it wasn't screaming bullish really until 2017, and now obviously the kickoff of 2018. And I think part of that has been the, the different policies that President Trump was elected on we all knew we we're going to be good for the economy. I think the first, you know, maybe six months, even 
arguably until the end of the year, the biggest question mark is, is this administration going to be able to actually get the things done they said they were going to get done? And so I think there was some question mark and some people holding back of, yeah, we're really going to really jump into this market until we get the tax reform passed. And once it finally passed, I think all of the people who were maybe, whether you want to call them anti-Trumpers or you want to call them, you know, they just didn't believe that it was going to happen, even without being an anti-Trumper, they just didn't think that government can ever pass anything anymore because they're so inefficient. When it actually happened and they realized, I got to get bullish in this market because everything is lining up whether it you know you, we've got a fantastic economy here in the United States but it's it's going abroad now too we're seeing strength in Europe we're seeing a lot of growth in Europe we're seeing even South America excluding Venezuela that's its own mess um, obviously but outside of Venezuela you've got a strong South America you've got strong Asia right now China is firing on all cylinders Japan is doing well Korea is doing I mean Things internationally are growing. We have a full labor market. We have S&P companies beating on the top line. I know we're going to get to that to talk about some of these earnings, but I'll be honest, today's announcement from Intel was the one that has me as excited about almost any earnings report out there. Um, I guess it was last night, but Intel's number uh, to me, uh, they're old, they're huge. And for them to have good top line growth, that's exciting, in, in my opinion, uh, for the potential growth of the economy right now. And because of all of those things, I think the only obstacle that this market can, can hit right now is the Federal Reserve. And whether the Fed is going to push the brakes from a monetary policy standpoint, but so far they have not signaled that they want to. Yeah, they're, they're talking about raising rates, but they're so caught in this fear of deflation that this market is running right now. And I don't, you know, I, I said we were going to melt up. I thought we could get to 3,500, put to 3,400 on the S&P. I don't, at this rate, we're going to hit that by April. Um, I hope not. Because I'm not that bullish. <laughs> my positions aren't that bullish. I do have some covered calls on some of my stocks um, that I don't want taken away. But anyhow, yeah, the 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 bull is on, and until we see some something else come in and try to push the brakes, uh, it's going to keep going. I would love to see a pullback. To be honest, I'm when when markets get this bullish, this parabolic, it makes you start to question. Okay, this is feeling too bullish. And you know the you know the faster it goes up, the quicker it's going to come down too. I'd love to see a breather. If we could even just go sideways for a couple of weeks, that would be fantastic. Let us reset some of these overbought RSIs and overbought technical indicators because right now it's getting we're getting in the ether on this. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know if you saw the. I pulled up a. The, I was I guess it was a few slides ago, but Karen mentioned it, and you know she said the uh, a, a weekly chart. I went back. I pulled. So here's a ten year weekly chart on the S P five hundred. So those are those weeklies. Yeah, those are weekly bars. This is ten years. This is going back to two thousand seven. Okay, look at the R S I here. Look at it. You, I mean, you bear on the weeklies. We barely get above here, and like Karen pointed out, we're up over ninety on the RSI. That is incredibly overbought. And I saw somebody posted a technical saying that you know four times. Um, this has only happened four times in history that you know we've had the RSI. You know, coincident with all these other indicators, um, and it, it and the the technical that they showed um, indicated. I'll see if I can find it. Um, showed that uh, the market, uh, you know. Three months, six months was higher, even though we were overbought. So sometimes it's a so what we're talking about here from a technical standpoint, this is called an oscillator because they tend to you know seek an average, and so it spends some time above, and then it spends some time below, and it kind of goes back and forth. And when you get too far in one side, that might be the time to buy, and when you're too close to one you know to high, that might be you know time to sell. And some that generally works, but we're in this different market. I, I swear. I mean, just the past two years have been the weirdest market. I mean, it's not like anything I've ever seen before. 
um, I mean, I got a good solid decade of keeping an eye on this, and you know, I don't. But and and I go back and back test and and look, you know, on twenty or thirty years, even longer. I don't, I don't remember seeing a period with this low volatility, no pullbacks, and and now we're going freaking parabolic here. I mean, it's just it's insane. It's insane. I mean, from a technical yeah. standpoint, you ha you have to say it's going to pull back. Go on, Karen. Well, I was just going to say, looking at that MACD, that is something I hadn't looked at coming into the session, but but looking at your MACD as well, take a look at the velocity of that MACD. The only other time, really, that you see quite that velocity and that size uh, on the uh, histogram bar is back after 2008. So kind of the when we started the, the recovery, basically, in 2009 uh, was the last time you see that. So, I mean, momentum is a force and obviously that fear of missing out FOMO you know as we call it is obviously in play record inflows in particular into the SPY which is sort of that passive investing thesis of you know especially individuals like you said who have not been involved and finally capitulate and say okay I give up I can't take it anymore I have to you know same sort of thing that happens in market bottoms when when the last holdout sell and that's the bottom and off we go same sort of, of scenario here and i'm not saying we're topping out at this moment certainly uh with this very strong momentum but you do kind of have to to look at it shake your head a little bit and and, and really to buy here with the assumption that we don't pull back and that we just continue to go higher you're if you're playing odds the odds are not really in your favor on that particular trade at this moment in time. I agree with you, Greg. The best scenario is just a pause, just a healthy pause that, that resolves this. But when you start to get these straight lines to the upside, that's oftentimes when the little mini air pockets, maybe you want to call it, are formed and it can come down just as hard. So that's why we hedge and that's why we have, as you mentioned, secondary exits in place. It's ready to go just in case. Hey. And to be honest, just so you guys aren't looking at your portfolios right now and you're looking at the strategies that you've learned from us and you're wondering, man, I'm up this month, but I'm not up like the market is. Well, part of that is good that you're not up like the market is because that means you're being you're being proper in your trade structure. You know, when we when you, when we teach proper risk management and you actually apply proper risk management, you're not going to beat the market when it's doing this kind of thing. Um, because you can't and still be properly hedged. You have to be all out bullish and the risk of being all out bullish, I, you pointed out very well, Karen, is that at this level, you have to start being cautious. I mean, the weekly trade that I did today on Verizon, just my selection of Verizon in and of itself was like, I would, I would love to say, let's go do Netflix, but can you even, and it's not that I'm in, I'm in Netflix. I am, I've got a big position in Netflix, <laughs> but I can't buy any more at this level. I mean, it's it's insane up here. I, I have to wait for a pullback uh, before I jump in there. So yeah, it's uh, an interesting bullish market that I, I expect we, we need a pullback soon. I don't, I still don't think the pullback is going to be very big because I agree with what you said, Eric. I think there's a lot of money waiting to get to running because of all of the underlying fundamentals in the worldwide economy that are good right now. And, and so even though the market may be a little bit ahead of it and getting expensive, it's really the only con you can find out there for this marketplace is simply that the valuations are so high that it needs to breathe for a little bit, go sideways if nothing else, maybe even have a three to 5% pullback and then take off and go bullish again because of earnings like Intel's that we just had. I mean, earnings like Netflix. I don't know if you guys see Netflix this week. Don't you follow me on Twitter? <laughs> I do. I know you saw Netflix this week. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was doing the happy dance this week. I did an exploding bull put, a rather large one on on it. <laughs> so I was I could buy a car. <laughs> I was I was a good week. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good move. Uh yeah. I, I, I by the way, I love that trade because it's like you do have you know the protection to the downside. You've got high probability, and if it explodes up, it just it just and it it exceeded my expectations, and man, it continued to run. But I hit my primary exit, and I I was out. So, 
Um, yeah, I, I just, I felt, you know, I, I, you know, thinking ahead, I don't want to get too far ahead with earnings, but uh, be interesting to see some, you know, not too far away um, is, you know, we've got Apple coming up in a few weeks, but we get some other earnings coming up next week, some tech companies. Of course, uh, Starbucks disappointed. But one thing I do want to do, so what, what we had this really bullish discussion before we go too far, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the volatility indices and so, you know, the VIX, which is a little bit higher than, you know, than we, we've been talking about it being, you know, potentially getting into the low eights here. And, you know, now we're hovering around 11. So there is a little more volatility there. I wanted to point out the VIX futures, though. So the bottom line here is the VIX. These are the VIX futures. And the VIX is a calculation. It's based on puts on the SPX options, the cash settled in this index. It's a, it's, it is a direct indication of whether options are expensive or cheap. That's really all the VIX is. If the VIX is high, then SPX options that expire in 30 days are high or around there. That's basically all it means that's what can you assume from that is that well well when it's high people are nervous right so but the vix futures of course are traced are traded based on what people's perception of what the vix might be in the future and what 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 i see here is this rising up in the at least this is the march future this is june futures uh, that where we, we did get a little bit of, we got a little spike up and then a pullback and we, the futures haven't come back down. In fact, they've gone up a little bit while the VIX has gone down. So sometimes we see the VIX futures move in one direction. And, and this is why it's really dangerous to trade those. When people are trading a VIX derivative, you're not trading the VIX, you're trading something that's based on the VIX futures, whether it's options on the futures or the actual futures on the futures or some other sort of derivative. There's some really funky stuff that's out there and you you're like well the vix went down but wait why did my trade go the other way and that that happens or the other way you know the vix went up and yours didn't trade you're like why did i not make more money the vix moved 10 percent and my my etf didn't change and uh it's it's a little bit of subtlety but i do this this is a little bit bearish concern so we've got vix a little bit higher that's a bearish concern but see that what i usually do when i, I go to look to the futures and say okay what are the futures telling me and they go oh wow the futures are still hanging up here um that means somebody's sort of betting that they want to see the vix up around 13 uh in the next month that that's what somebody in the market or people in the market maybe that's where the market thinks they feel a little bit comfortable there. So that that does, that is a little bit of fear. Um, that is a little bit of fear in the marketplace and, and something we should be aware of. And I wanted to take that and, and go down a couple other paths and talk about some sentimental indicators. And when I do the slides, I, and Karen did the slides, by the way, but I, I threw in a couple extras of my mind, of my own. And Karen did an awesome job as usual. Thank you, darling. Uh, you're welcome. This is the CNN Money Fear and Greed Index. Um, this this you know it oscillates between extreme greed and fear and i wish we had an s p 500 chart to throw in here with it and to see but generally speaking when it's very high those are usually market tops and the very lows so we've been much much higher and, the, and these haven't been any we haven't had any bearish markets for quite a while uh, but we are pretty high we're up in this extreme greed stuff and that that is a little bit of a cause for caution for me when too too many people and I think that's what that'll be the sign of the top is when everybody says, "Fine, I'm 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 going to just put all my money in the market. I'm I'm all in." When when and everybody's like, "It just it's going to continue to go higher, and I got to get in." And everybody and your grandmother, or they're all putting money in the market. That'll be the top. So these these warning signs of extreme you know euphoria in the market, we we need to keep an eye on that. It's not a reason to be bearish, but. Uh, there is another change in sentiment that I want to share with you. So I, I subscribe to the Bespoke Premium uh, newsletter, uh, and I, I share some of the results. But there was a day today, and they, they pointed out and said that there's a significant shift in short interest this week. And so on the 25th, the data from 10 days before, so short interest, that's how many shares that bears have borrowed from shareholders with the intention that they'll sell it at, at, a, at this price and buy it back at another price. And that, that is another bearish sentimental indicator. So I think, I think implied volatility 
and short interest are two of the best ways to get an objective measure of what the market's thinking. So there was a pretty significant shift. So this shows where it was two because it's updated every two weeks. So this shows where the short interest was and where it is today. And what we're seeing, so going to the right means more bears. And everything across the board, all the sectors, every one of the sectors here, there has been a shift in bearish sentiment, more than where it was, some more than others. But everything went in the same direction. Now, that doesn't mean that a crash is coming. It doesn't mean that at all. It's, it's just you know one of those things that you got to say, mm, okay, let's take a look at this because some people are bearish. And does this mean that I need to be hedged? And, and we preach this all the time. Is this means you got to have your secondary exits in place. And when you're not sure what to do, I know what Karen would say. I know what Greg would say, and that is they would tell you, well, we're not giving trading advice, but I know what I know what I do in my account. I know what they do in their account. We go put ourselves in a collar trade and protect ourselves in case something happens. But I want to dive a little bit deeper down on this because there's some information here that that might make your jaws drop a little bit. I'm going to look at some of the individual companies that are shorted. So these are the S&P 500 most heavily shorted stocks. And this is one that I know a lot of people like to look at, Under Armour. It is now at 31%. That's 31% of all the shares that exist are short. That is, that's pretty darn huge. And there's some other names that are in there. You go down a little bit lower, Harley Davidson sometimes. But I, I know that, so down here, we got a whole bunch of retail. So I know we have some people that trade Mattel and Nordstrom's and Macy's, Ralph Lauren. So there's a, there's a bunch of retail and they're, you know, 15% of the shares the short that's now this information you don't have to get it from bespoke it's available other places you can you can find it on on google a number of different places but they just did a nice job presenting this information so this is something to be aware of the other thing if you're not familiar with short interest there is a phenomenon called short squeeze which actually makes the stock price go higher and so even though this is what you know somebody who's trading under armor somebody who's a little bit savvy they may want to put a bullish trade on it because these bears, when the price goes up, they don't like that. It puts a lot of pain on them. So if it goes up, it, it those people could decide to get out. When they get out, they buy the stock, makes the stock go higher. So these are these are all candidates potentially for short squeeze. But and what usually happens is that shakes itself out and then the stock goes back down again. So it's another reason to be careful and just not trade just technically to really dig down and look at some of these sentimental indicators. And you know, if you see a stock moving really bullish, you oh everybody's bullish, I'm going to go buy it. And then you find out what's just short squeeze, and when all the short interest is gone, then it goes down. So you're going to be careful with that. Now on the other side of the chart is the least shorted stocks, and this is. This is kind of interesting here. Um, so Pepsi of all of the S&P 500, less than 0.5 or 0.53 percent. Uh, Microsoft, Philip Morris. There's some real good quality in here. Some interesting companies. So these are the companies that have the least amount of short interest. Um, I'll leave it for you to digest, but there, I just thought going back to this and seeing a shift in short interest, it is another sentimental indicator. I showed the VIX futures here that we got this bump up. And so the, I'll let you two respond. I don't know who's starting to talk. Was that Karen or, or Greg? Well, I was going to, I just sent you a chart because I actually started as we in the background. I thought, you know what, I'm going to see if I can find something with a longer term back to when the RSI was this overbought. And I actually found kind of a scary chart. Um, I sent you an email. It's actually somebody else's work. Uh, I found it on Twitter, but it's um, talk. It's, it's some interesting trend lines that he's drawn in. What, what drew me to it first was the overbought RSI, but the interesting trend line in his caption, by the way, says SPX hell is almost here. Enjoy your weekend. Um, <laughs> but it, it's uh, – we're very overbought. We've had a significant rally. And honestly, if we don't get a pullback, I do get more and more worried that something's going to be this bad. So here we go. So you can see up there on the top, the RSI level. This is the, like I remember, the last time it was this high was 1998, 1999. And the trend lines that are interesting is he's pointing out some, obviously, some potential reversal levels that it could hit based on a trend line. Now, it doesn't have to reverse when it hits that trend line, right? It could break right through it and go to the upper level of that trend line also. 
So there's a potential for the market to get really bullish, but there's also the potential for a big pullback right here. And the fact that we're as overbought as we are, uh, now these are monthly bars, by the way, these aren't weeklies. This is an SPX, this is a monthly uh, chart. So even that far left side back in 99 and 2000, even when we were hovering at the potential of a correction level, if you look at this and say, hey, there's a, you know, trend line that we're about to run into. This looks like resistance. Notice that for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten months, it hugged that top resistance line that 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 this individual is drawn in there. So we could keep hugging that top line, but I think what you have to do at this point is what Eric just mentioned. Watch things like short interest watch volatility those are going to be our telltale signs and to me one of the other ones that i continue to watch and karen i know you put this chart in here i'm still watching the yield curve on the the the, the difference between tens and twos right now um and that to me it continues to tighten we're continuing to seal the yield continuing to see the yield curve flatten now it's not negative yet we're still positive but it continues to trend lower, uh, this this difference between the two-year and the 10-year. And because of that, uh, if that ever does roll over, that could be, a, again, another indicator that it's time to take some profits off the table, maybe wait for a pullback to jump into the market. And I, I wouldn't say it's in any sense go short this market. That would be crazy at this point. I think you still have to be long right now because that's the trend. But your spidey senses should be going off here pretty soon that, hey, we're getting we're getting a little overbought and maybe it makes sense to take some profit off the table. You may not get all of the gain, uh, but it's uh, you never go broke taking a profit either, as an old saying that I once heard. All right. Spidey sense. I love that. That's great. Spidey sense. <laughs> Fantastic, Greg. I, I couldn't agree more. I let some things get called away in the past couple of weeks and oil and stuff that was just, you know, so unbelievably bullish and raise a little, it never hurts to raise a little cash in the middle of something like this. And and that gives you opportunities or, or gives you cash available to try to spot opportunities. So uh, stay long, but hedged. I think that's what we're saying. So this is another chart. Somebody emailed me this week that said that's interesting. This is one I alluded to earlier. And so this is still looking at a different RSI, looking at a 14-month RSI. And every time that we've gotten above 85, what what's it look like six months, 12 months, 24, 36 months later? And six months, we're up 7.6. And 12, we're up 17. And 24, 55. So these are generally considered really overbought. And the market, every time that's happened, has plowed forward. So it's so this is this is on the other side of the case. Maybe this is a bear. Maybe this is a bullish indicator. I don't know. I, I think you have to look at everything. I don't think any one of these is going to be right. That's the thing that scares me, too, with technicals is they can. They can go back and find the technical that proves whatever yeah, they want. Yeah, and even pointing back, like you said, pointing back to that chart that I just sent you, it doesn't, just because it's at that middle potential resistance line, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to hold. It may blast to the upper one right now. That's a yeah. very real chance. We could keep going bullish. I just want a breather. <laughs> All right. What else drove the market this last week? Um, I know we've got some earnings uh, that – that performed really well. We had some economic data. Let's talk about that first. Economic data was kind of mixed. I mean, we had some home sales data that was a, both missed expectations, though pretty solid numbers, to be honest. Both new home sales uh, and existing home sales were were okay, considering the, the mortgage rate is starting to creep up. Uh, you do see that starting to climb back up again. So new home sales uh, was good. GDP actually missed its number for the month. Um, though still in a nice positive trend line, the, the best one I saw this year, this week was the durable goods order. Uh, the durable goods number was solid, uh, indicating to me that this is a reflection of, of things to come because I believe we're just starting to see the tip of the iceberg when it comes to capital expenditure because of the new tax bill. 
uh, I think that's, again, if you believe what Apple said, they're going to bring a lot of money back home and they're going to put it to work here. They're going to be doing a lot of durable goods orders. And that was a very positive number. Um, so, uh, yeah, economic events were kind of mixed, but I'm still saying they were relatively positive. The other one was uh, initial claims, which uh, was up a little bit. Um, so they, they revised it was seven up seventeen thousand from last week. We're at two thousand thirty uh, thirty three or sorry two hundred and thirty three thousand initial claims. It's seasonally adjusted, which okay. But I think putting in this perspective, we go back to seventy two and and really look at where we're at and and see. So this dotted line is a four week average, is what it is. That's what that dotted line, but. It, it shows that we're somebody made a comment earlier in one of the chats about you know are, are we near full time full uh, unemployment and I and I argue that we can we can get down into the low threes uh, mid to low threes I think we can see a three we'll find out next week we're getting ahead of ourselves but the the employment situation I think we can see a, a three point five if things continue to go the way they are. Cause you know, I, I do think from a fundamental standpoint that you know the GDP is plowing forward. Uh all all of the things. And I think there's opportunity, more opportunity for growth. I, I this is hard to to get um to get this much, much lower th than here. Um, I mean, I don't know that we can get down to 200,000 be just because of the way things work. I mean, some people just automatically get laid off seasonally and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, we can only get so low. But the, I do think the employment situation, I think we are going to see inflation. We are going to see wage growth. And the other big one, you touched on home sales. So new home sales, is, you know, uh, it, it's a choppy number. So it, it didn't freak people out. Uh, but one of the things that I did want to point out, and that is the difference between uh, existing homes and, and new homes. And they, for historically, there's always been a pretty good correlation between those. And through the crisis that happened through 2007, uh, you know, both markets took a real beating, but new home sales took a real beating. I mean, look at this. I mean, we are still not even back to where we were back in 94 for new home sales. That market has not come back. And during this period of time, not, you know, all of this time, new home sales is what grew the market. And we're not even there yet. And I mean, we talk about shifting demographics and millennials. Heard an interesting stat: one in four millennials has a hundred thousand dollars in their four hundred one k. And I, I think they're a little bit more conservative, probably because they're tempered by you know they they lived through this. They're old enough to remember it. Maybe they were you know, you know, young teenagers or something. But they they certainly uh, are, are astute enough to know that that happened. And maybe that's impacting them. But those people are going to buy homes eventually. And maybe it's multi-level homes. I don't know. They're not all going to live in communes and they're going to move out of their parents' basement someday. Uh, and I, I do think, you know, what, what's going to happen when, you know, when we get we get start getting inflation, we, we start getting wage growth, and we start getting housing really taking off. I mean, I the mark it, the, this market could continue to rip just insanely higher. I, it, it can happen. I mean, I know we're giving arguments for both, and I always trade hedged. I mean, I always make sure that I have an exit strategy. But there, I think you can make a, a bullish case here too to, for the market to continue. And I and I don't think anybody could deny that. I, mean, I, I think the case is there. Especially yeah. if you read, especially if you you know saw Netflix earnings. Ah, yeah, Netflix was <laughs> well, that was fun. Uh, yeah. I'll put it up. was fun. I keep I keep wishing I don't have. I keep having. I keep thinking. Okay, this this short call is okay. I'll sell this one. That's twenty dollars out of the money. And then and then two days later, it's in the money. And I'm like, all right, I'll roll it out twenty more dollars. And then it goes in the money. <laughs> twenty dollars. Good. Good that, that's a logarithmic chart. And look at it. Uh, yeah, my, yeah. I'm now t I'm now and now I'm now five dollars in the money again on my short call. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, maybe you're gonna maybe be I'll, selling. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll let it go. <laughs> you're gonna sell some stock, and Starbucks got stock. beat up uh, this week. So Intel was fantastic. Um, Karen, which of these were you talking about this? Were you following this week? I wish Jeff was here to talk about American. 
Yeah, uh, well, I'll talk about Starbucks and my stocks to watch since it's one I picked for the year. But uh, as far as the airlines go, that is one area that had some volatility, downside volatility this week. And it was actually the dreaded words that you never want to hear if you are investing in airlines, additional capacity. And it wasn't American that said it, it was actually uh, United that said yeah. it in their earnings report. And uh, they were down double digits. Uh, Delta, American, the, you know, the entire space uh, sold off on that. The earnings have been good, actually, in this space. So I think that that might present a short-term sentimental opportunity uh, for some of these, uh, particularly American and Delta. But um, uh, those are the ones that I was following. And I'll, I'll save Starbucks for my stocks to watch section. Uh, Greg, do you follow any of those? What's that? What's United symbol now? UAL. UAL, I believe. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you follow any of those, Greg, besides Netflix? Um, no, and yeah, I, a handful of them. Intel's earnings were solid. Uh, you know, both uh, Freeport MacMoran and Halliburton um, reported this last week. I think the, the picture, if you take a, a step back so far, you have to say, and the reason why I pointed out Intel is to being the the highlight is you, the, the highlight to me so far this earnings season as the as a conglomerate S and P is we're beating on top line revenues, and that's exciting. That means the economy is really growing. It's not just financial engineering. It's not just the companies buying back shares so that they manipulate their earnings per share higher. It is legitimate demand for product, and we're seeing it in a lot of different spaces. And you know, even though Starbucks got beat up, and I'm interested to hear your. Uh, your commentary on it later, Karen, is I think I, I listened to the interview that, that um, I think was it Kramer that did the interview this morning on CNBC with, with the CEO of, of Starbucks. I have to say it still is pretty exciting. I, I'm still pretty bullish on Starbucks, even though they, uh, you know, didn't perform here domestically. That was one of the things that, that caused them to have a little bit of a pullback, but um yeah, the, the airline industry did get beat up. I think this is a competition thing. Competition's good for all things, and you know they've had a nice rip to the upside. This is one of the reasons why I think Warren Buffett said he'll never own airlines, uh, is because they do these type of things. Of course, then he went and bought airlines, right? Doesn't he own United? Uh, anyway. He owns a bunch of airlines. Yeah. They have a lot of cash right now. That's definitely one thing. It's one of the reasons why Boeing keeps ripping to the upside, even though they're selling more Airbuses right now, it seems like, than Boeing's. But market doesn't care. It's just uh, – at least Boeing doesn't care. Boeing just goes up. Yeah, Boeing just goes up. Yeah. <laughs> they never land. You want to talk about a, a, a uh, parabolic chart. Boeing's chart is parabolic right now. Un – believable to the upside that stock just goes up seven bucks every day it paused a little bit but yeah look at that it was at 160 yeah 156 <laughs> it's 345 dollars 346 dollars a share it's crazy yeah yeah Crude's high. Um, I, I mean, it's been, made a nice bullish run here over the past few months. Um, continues to run up. I'm not. A, I mean, crude impacts our economy. Uh, nobody's howling yet. Uh, I, I, I do think there, there's some natural resistance that's in there because capacity is going to come on. I understand that we're going to hit our, our new capacity is going to go back and exceed apparently what we were when Nixon was in office. So a lot of a lot of American capacity coming online. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see what, what happens. A crude going too high is not good, but high, up here, uh, start making it good for some of the, the oil companies, um, bringing some service and seeing some capital. Again, that's going to, these when the refinery starts spending money because they're making more money, uh, there's a lot of ancillary businesses that are going to do well because other capital projects, people you know do projects and they buy steel and then steel workers get jobs and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, oil going up and, and getting at that that sector of the economy. Too high is bad for the economy, but somewhere around here is kind of a, getting close to a sweet spot uh, where it's going to be uh, good for business. And, and that could be another boon economically. Another one that was this week for earnings, Caterpillar was up huge, um, was a really good uh, 3%. But um, in the pre-market, ended up 
coming down flat, but uh, they had, re- you know, record sales. I think top best sales they've had in 10 years, just phenomenal. Uh, another good sign because they're a, a bellwether for, for not just the U S but, but internationally uh, because they sell a lot of products around the world, especially China. So lots of reasons to be bullish out there. So do you want to jump to what's going on next week? we got a big week next week for, for economic reports. There's a lot of stuff coming out. Um, of course, the biggest one is the Michigan sentiment. No, wait. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> joking. Uh, non-farm payrolls and the unemployment situation. That's the big kahuna. That's the one that's going to drive the market. Uh, Greg, what else are you looking at this week? Karen, what are you looking at this week? Well, obviously payrolls are always important. So we'll take a look at that on Friday. We've got the ISM index. We'll talk about manufacturing. We've got some continuing home sale information. This is one of those weeks where we have a lot of information from all of the different uh, sectors, areas of the economy that we watch. I love these kinds of weeks because I feel like we get a lot of info. Consumer confidence, which has been, of course, astoundingly uh, high. Uh, It'll be interesting to see if it continues to stay there. PC prices. Our outgoing Fed chair, Janet Yellen, said that that's the the number that she she has focused on most closely. That's not necessarily to say that uh, uh, it's going to remain that way for our new Fed board. We shall see. But uh, a lot of great info. Uh, And we want to take a look, you know, and parse through this data carefully because all of this bullishness and, and excitement, maybe, if we don't want to call it exuberance or irrationality or whatever, let's just call it excitement anyway in the market, uh, is predicated on this pattern and all of these things that Eric, you so beautifully discussed, continuing. So that's why we always want to pay attention to these numbers. FOMC, don't really expect any surprise there. I don't think they're going to raise rates here, especially with her leading and whatnot. So I, don't, I think that's going to be a, a non-event. Greg, anything in particular here? Jobs. That's to me the one I look at. Any, anytime it's on the list, that's the one I look at, non-farm payroll. So we'll see how that comes in. Ditto. Okay. Well, then let's move to announcements. Well, Greg, I'll, you want to talk about announcements or no? Yeah, just a couple of them. Just to, just to remind, we're late on time, so I'll just remind you. We're, we've are we got a couple of fun events coming up. We've got uh, Trade School, which is obviously our partner event we do with E-Trade. Uh, our first one we're kicking off in, in Dana Point in uh, on February 10th. So that's coming up in just a couple of weeks. Uh, so if you live in Southern California, want to come spend the day with us, learn how to use E-Trade's platform, get some education from myself. Uh, we're going to be doing that uh, February 10th. And then the big event is March 23rd and 24th uh, in San Antonio, uh, our next upcoming summit. So look, looking forward to that one as well. So just make, make, your, uh, make your travels. Lucy got mad at somebody, you know. Oh, wow. No. That was great. <laughs> no, that's my wife. The garage door just opened. So oh, okay. yeah. So, uh, yeah. The other one is tomorrow is uh, Jeff and I are doing the traders workshop. So uh, it, it'll be on noon Eastern time. We spent about four hours going through. I've been actually doing some due diligence. Uh, I almost always place the trade. So this is a lot like a 6.9 where 6.9, we go through setting up a trade, except it's stuff we actually want to trade and how we actually trade it. So 6.9 isn't how I normally trade because it's, we're just using the information that we have up until level six. Uh, I trade in my own, you know, my own way. And then, and so this is real trading and and some good stuff. So I'm going to go through. Uh, an example of a Tesla trade that I have open right now. I just want to walk people through it and show it. And then I'll come up with a couple of different companies that I'm going to trade and I'll go through the all due diligence and Jeff will do something like that too. So if you're interested in coming, it is recorded. It's archived. You can't make it, uh, but get with customer service. If you don't see the link, you should be able to see the link on the community website. If you can't see the link, then, then get with uh, get with customer service right away. Okay, take us to our stocks to watch. Let's uh, start with Karen today. What do you got, Karen? Okay, well, I already mentioned the first one, which was Starbucks, Sierra Bravo Bravo Uniform X-Ray. Uh, I loved what you discussed, Greg. Actually, I haven't had a lot of time to sit and really parse through the, uh, the earnings report yet. Uh, anytime that you get 
comp sales that aren't favorable. That's never going to be good for any sort of retailer. And it certainly wasn't for Starbucks. Technically speaking, however, it closed off of the low point of the day, fell right to what we would consider to be an initial support at the low point of the day at about $56, $57. I'll be taking some time to go through those fundamentals and, and read through uh, what was said on this conference call. But this could be an interesting opportunity. I won't likely trade it for the next several days, but wait to see if you get follow through to the downside or if you start to see uh, any sort of appetite given that we don't get pullbacks as we've discussed uh, if investors might want to come in here so that's my first one the other two I just thought I'd, I'd take a look at the equities that I'm watching for the year so the second one is Macy's uh, ticker symbol M as in Michelle I realize that's not the phonetic alphabet but nonetheless uh, Eric, it was really intriguing when you were talking about short interest because uh, with Macy sitting at, I think it was about 15% short interest or so, uh, it was higher levels a few months ago. It was over 20%. So we've already seen, uh, and I think that that's part of what you see in that bullish chart, uh, 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 short interest covering at this point. Uh, I continue <clears throat> to see articles, discussions about this company being a potential takeover candidate for Amazon. Uh, I trade this, I have shares, it's a great dividend payer. I use uh, put diagonals and things of that sort as hedges. Got in right there at that last earnings event toward the bottom there at about 17. Uh, it's not uh, parabolically moving, but it certainly is holding its own at this point in time. So uh, that's an interesting one to take a look at. And then finally, uh, Exxon, that was my third company for the year, X-Ray, Oscar Mike, uh, and if it, as much as the oil space has, uh, had a really nice bullish trend here to start off the year, and, and this was one that was sort of left behind some of the others, Occidental Petroleum and, and some others had outperformed last year, so maybe a little bit of catch up going on. Uh, I think that uh, as it gets close to overbought conditions, uh, it may hesitate here for a bit. This again, a good dividend paying stock uh, and an interesting one to take a look at, uh, bull puts, covered calls, all those sorts of things are great to uh, trade candidates. So those are my three to watch. Eric, what are you looking at? Well, first thing I'm going to do is take myself on mute. <laughs> Can you guess what my first stock to watch would be? <laughs> I'm going to steal yours. And it's going to be company. Apple. It's a fruit company from Cap Cupertino, yes. Um, Apple has been – the haters want to hate. Uh, there's been a lot of people that have been trying to drag this thing down. We had some, I think, some dubious reports that came out uh, over the holidays. Uh, some other pullbacks. Um, lots. I'm gonna be. I, I am going to trade it. I am probably gonna trade it bullishly and doing something that will put me as a secondary exit on stock going through it. Well, we'll we'll see. I have to think when we get a little bit closer. It's anybody. Nobody knows where it, it can go up. It can go down. Um, I'll take a look at where I think it can move and determine where I'm going to put my break evens. But uh, I, I would only trade it because I'm willing to own it. So, you know, if it goes up, I make money. If it goes sideways, I'll break even or make money. If it goes down a little bit, I'll be able to get out for a small profit. If it goes down a little bit more than a little bit, I'll buy it. If it goes down a lot, well, then we'll see what happens. But uh, interesting to see a lot of uh, the home pods out now. Finally, that came out for pre-order. I can't understand why anybody would spend 350 bucks. If you already have an Alexa, I already have three Alexas. I don't think I'm going to buy a home pod. So anyways, February 1st is, uh, earnings for Apple and I am most definitely going to trade it. Uh, the second stock for, to watch, and this is one that's, I meant to talk about it a little bit earlier. And folks, if you've been listening to me talk about this for a while, you would kind of be in tune to this. Uh, Twitter, um, I've been in it for a while. Big move today. And the reason that it went up today, by the way, oh, she's answering me by the, the name that I just said. She, she's answering me because she heard me talk, say her name, <laughs> the home assistant. <laughs> Big move today in Twitter um, based on a, a, a short seller who's had in the past been short on Twitter, came out today and said, I am not short on Twitter. I am long on Twitter because I think they're going to be acquired. So I, I like Twitter. I, I'm still playing that same song. I still think it could go. We have the um, the horned owl pattern going on here. I'm kidding. I just made that up. It does kind of look like a horned owl, though, right? You got two little ears. Is that, is that the hoodie? I, I just made it up. I'm kidding. Uh, Twitter is my uh, second stock to watch. Uh, the other one is it, one I, I don't 
there's still some value that's out there when you look at companies and one of the few companies that I think is still underpriced. And and there's there's another one that I'm not going to mention because I'm going to save it for you guys tomorrow. So if you guys are coming to the trading, there's a, a company I'm really excited about. One I never talk about. I'm only going to save it for you. I'll talk about it tomorrow. It will be setting up a trade on it. So come. It's a big secret. Won't tell you what it is unless you're there. Um, GM is the one. Is another one though. So there's another one I'm not talking about. GM, Generous Motors, uh, Golf Michael. Uh, I still think the company's worth. I think there were something around sixty dollars, sixty plus. I think fundamentally great company, lots of room to grow. Um, I really only became a fan a few months ago because of the fundamentals. And so uh, those are my three stocks to watch. And I'll turn it over to you. All right. First one I'll look at is one that I – ETF that I was looking at a couple weeks ago. The trend is still going. That is Golf Lima Delta. Uh, gold is still trending higher right now. Uh, and, again, it's primarily a – dollar story uh they they are at an interesting level here at you know in the 128 range you can see that was the former high back in september uh before it then took a big dip again so that we, you might see a little bit of a battle going on i just think you're going to see a little bit of profit taking let the rsi reset exactly what i wish the s p would do right now but i think the upward trend in gold is going to continue uh so that's the first one i'm looking at um, this week. The next one I'm looking at is uh, I'll actually be looking at this company very, very close next week, uh, and that is Delta India Sierra. Um, not from the standpoint of I'm looking at the stock, I'm actually going to help contribute to their earnings next week. Uh, the fam and I are making the trip to Anaheim actually tomorrow. Uh, we're we're uh, getting on the road. My kids love to do road trips, so we're going to get on the road. We're going to drive our 10 hour drive down to uh, Anaheim. Um, we bought a bunch of new movies to throw in the car while we're driving. We're gonna have a fun drive through uh, Southern Utah and uh, and Nevada and we're gonna go spend some money at Disneyland this week. Um, I do actually like where their stock's at. They've got earnings in a couple weeks. They've had a hard time getting through this 113, 114 level. As you can see, that goes clear back to May. It'll be interesting to see if some of the changes they've made, the pay cuts, you know, the, the payroll changes they've made at ESPN, some of the cord cutting, some of the some of the things that they talked about with their last earnings report that Bob Iger talked about that got the company excited again, uh, got the stock moving again back to the upside. We'll see how many of them they've been able to implement, kind of some of their game plan. Um, but quite honestly, this is a stock that I still just believe, the, a company that just prints money. Um, with with all of the different product lines they have. So I, I like Disney right here. I think there's a chance for them to finally break above this 114 level, but that's a key level I'm looking at. Last one is, is an earnings play this coming week, um, and I'm sure it's on most of your lists as well. Uh, it's not Apple's not the only one announcing this week, Eric. <laughs> you talked about Apple. It's the company that's just a little bit smaller than Apple market cap-wise. There's not many companies bigger than Facebook. Face plant Bravo, as Jeff would call it. Um, Facebook has earnings this week, and they've had a nice, or excuse me, next week on the 1st, I believe, uh, is their earnings event. If their earnings go anything like some of the other FANG stocks that have announced so far, uh, expect this stock to be in the low 220s uh, sometime you know, two weeks from now. I don't know. I can't guarantee that it's going to do that. This one has a much bigger market cap than Netflix does already. So it's not as if, you know, it's going to be the first time. You know, Netflix just went over a hundred billion market cap. You know, the market cap on on Facebook is significantly higher than that uh, already. But again, it's in the Fang space, and they still dominate. Uh, their place. The only reason it had its pullback a couple of weeks ago, remember, was all on an assumption based off of, you know, some comments that Mark Zuckerberg made that said, hey, we're going to rearrange our news feed and make, you know, not as many advertisements. We're going to try to make it more people centric. Uh, and of course, the market immediately sold it off and the stock went from 190 to 175 in a few days. It's right back at 190. Uh, and quite honestly, anytime you see assumptive moves like that, even when they're on really heavy volume, you, we don't know what that's going to do uh, to the to the earnings. So this earnings report is going to be very interesting, particularly with their commentary of what their forward guidance is in relation to 
some of the changes there they will have made on their news feed any type of blip in my opinion to the downside is going to create a buying opportunity because fundamentally these guys still are dominating the future of marketing and the future of advertising and and quite honestly potentially the future of entertainment uh, for that matter so are they expensive yes they traded a 37 price to earnings ratio could they get even higher yeah i think they could uh, i think you're going to see a big number from them next week it wouldn't be like i said would not be out of my realm to see this stock trading at 220 in a couple weeks don't go make a trade on it don't go bet on it um build your trade build your exit points build your both primary and secondary and make it on a rational decision okay those are the ones i'm looking at i also heard dell's considering to go an ipo again i don't know if you saw the announcement yeah. they're buying they're buying vmware uh right now and considering ipoing again We'll see. Well, they bought EMC. That didn't go so well. And then VMware spun off of EMC. And everybody needs new laptops. You know, that's that's the such a <laughs> desktop computers. That's def definitely the market people. Yeah, yeah, I I know. Yeah, good luck with that. Might be a good might be a good short opportunity. We'll see. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure All they right. have a good idea, but go on. Any uh, any final thoughts before we wrap it up for the week? Karen, I'll start with you. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. Greg, travel safely with the uh, Jensen family. And Greg, one question that keeps coming up over here in the ch chat is about your uncle and uh, that sort of uncle indicator that you talk about in the marketplace. So have we heard from your uncle recently in terms of where yep. we are in the markets? <laughs> uncle Scott's been talking to me about the market lately. I hate to say it. <laughs> it may be the indicator. He's, uh, he's active again. There we go. Well, everybody remember primary and secondary exit. It's tradable bullishly, but uh, always know that uh, things can change. Thanks, gentlemen. It was a lot of fun as always. Eric. I want to tell everybody to get yourself to make a goal to go to at least one summit, if not all of them, but take a hard look in and plan on getting to San Antonio. Enough time to plan on it, work on the agenda. It's going to be, they just continue to get better and better. It's going to be a really good one. So, uh, look forward to seeing everybody at the summit and check the website for details. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you all again same time, same place next week. Have a great week.